How numbers deceive. All right, so we're just going to jump straight into an example. If Kevin had a higher shooting percentage, both in the first half, 40 to 25%, and in the second half, 75% to 70%, does this mean that Kevin had a better shooting percentage to the, for the game? And the answer is no. He could have, but not necessarily. And what we want to look at is uh, the attempts, right? So we can look at Kevin's percentage for the game by just totaling up the number of baskets he made versus baskets attempted. So he made four in the first half and three in the seven, second half. So that's seven overall out of a total of 14. So for the game, Kevin has seven whoops seven out of 14 or a 50 percent shooting right but kobe had one basket out of four attempts in the first half and seven out of ten in the second so he made a total of eight for the game out of 14 which is going to be a higher percentage eight out of 14 is 61 percent All right, so this is an idea called Simpson's Paradox. And what it is, it's the general case in which a set of data can give different results for each of several group comparisons than it does when the groups are taken together. And so I'll give you a quick visual and then we're gonna watch a little video, like a three minute video where this really excited British guy explains this. But a good visual of this would be like, if I look at a set of data Ooh, here's a good option for us to one time use. If you can annotate, all right, if I draw this set of data here, can you guys annotate on my screen? Can you draw what you think the line of best fit would look like? So if I asked you to fit a line to that data, what would it look like? Or are annotations turned off? Or are you guys gonna refuse to do? We did it on the first day of class. You click annotate. Is there not an annotate button? I don't know. They also did a stupid zoom update that might have uh, done something. Oh, there you go, Trey. All right. Now that's not the line of best fit. <laughs> Still way off. There we go. All right. I agree with that. Okay. Now, what if I took, now I want you to ignore the blue data. What if I did another data set here and I asked you to fit a line to that data? So ignore the blue, pretend like it's not there. Good. I agree with that. But now, if I asked you to take the blue and the pink together, so I'll just color them all green, and pretend that this is the data set, what do you think the line of best fit would look like for the data taken together? So it might be a little hard to visualize, but that one's gonna look like this. So it's actually not gonna be in that direction. It would be the data, and it's probably easier to visualize if I give you a third data set, but if I gave you a third data set like that, maybe then you can see that the trend is going in this direction, right? So generally, if we look at the data set separately, they go in a completely different direction. They trend in a completely different way than if we look at the data sets together.
All right, so let's look at this uh, excited British guy talk about it. Oh, whoops. Make sure I have my sound going for you. Hello everyone. Okay, I've got a new one for you today. It's one I only learned myself last year. When I saw it, I was really impressed. It's called Simpsons Paradox. Okay, it's not about why it sucked after season 9, or why the glove didn't fit. There you go, two references, 15 years out of date. That's a good way to start a video. No, instead, you're suffering from a mysterious and embarrassing illness. Okay, so the best kind, really. There are two drugs to cure this illness, drug A, drug B. So we put them on trial. On day one, drug A cures 63 out of 90 people. So right, it cures 63 out of 90 people. Uh, or in other words, it cures 70% of people. Now, again, on day one, drug B cures 8 out of 10 people. So it cures 80% of people. Okay, so on day one, drug B is winning. It cures 80% of people versus 70% of people. Right, so day two, we try the drugs again. On day two, drug A cures four out of ten people. So, hey, right, cures four out of ten people, or to put it another way, it cures 40% of people. Drug B, however, cures 45 out of 90 people, so it cures 50% of people. So again, drug B wins, it kills 50% of people versus 40% of people. So drug B appears to be the better drug. It's better on day one and it's better on day two. But have a look, overall, overall drug A cures 63 people there, four people there. So it cures 67 out of 100 people. It kills 67 out of 100 people, 67%. Drug B, however, kills eight people there, 45 people there. It kills 53 out of 100 people. So it kills 53% of people. So overall, drug A appears to be better. It kills 67% versus 53%. So this is the paradox. Which is the better drug? Drug B appears to be better on day one and better on day two. But overall, drug A appears to be better. Which is the better drug? In fact, this paradox is fairly easy to solve. It's drug A. Drug A is the better drug. This is the result to use. The overall result, it kills 67% of people. Drug A is the better drug. Now, if you just follow the percentages alone, then you will come to the wrong conclusion. So if you just look at the 70%, the 80%, the 40%, and the 50%, you will come to the wrong conclusion that drug B is the better drug. But you see, these things are weighted. Uh, they're not the same. We're not comparing like with like here. Um, so we cured 63 out of 90 people there and only 8 out of 10 people there. You're not comparing the same thing. So it is this figure that you should be using, the overall result. Now, this is not just in medical trials. This turns up in sport statistics, uh, exam results, all sorts of places. It's really important to be able to interpret your results correctly. Well, otherwise, you just end up sticking pins in people to cure people's headaches, which would be a ridiculous thing to do. So, there he is, just roasting acupuncture there at the end. Um, all right. So, there he gave you just kind of another example of Simpson's paradox and how it can manifest. So, let's jump to here and we're going to talk about test results. So, basically I have four different definitions. So when we're testing for something, especially in clinical trials, if you're trying to diagnose something, test results tend to not be 100% accurate. So we saw this kind of over the summer. Um, there was a lot of talk about the antibody test. So they were starting to test people for antibodies to see if they were maybe immune to the coronavirus after they had it, right? And they said that the antibody test was like 95% accurate. Um, but that, that figure is actually really misleading because 95% sounds great. But the result, that means it's 5% inaccurate, meaning um, right, a true positive 
sorry, you, you could receive a false positive 5% of the time, or you could receive a false negative 5% of the time. Um, and the way the numbers bear out, and I'll show you this example, is that if you have a test that's 95% accurate, and it also depends on the infection rate for whatever disease you're talking about, um, over the summer, they, were, they gave uh, COVID about a 5% infection rate. And the way the numbers work out is that if you went and got an antibody test and it, and it came up positive, meaning you do have the antibodies, um, there was only like a 32% chance that you actually truly had the antibodies because of the accuracy of the test and the infection rate. And so I'll show you that example and we can kind of see why. All right, so a true positive result is when a test correctly reports a positive result. A false positive is when a test incorrectly reports a positive result. True negative, it correctly reports a negative result. And false negative, a test incorrectly reports a negative result. All right, so this is a summary of results for 10,000 mammograms in which 100 of the women have malignant tumors and 9,900 have benign tumors. And so based on the numbers in this table, what is the percentage of women with negative test results who actually have cancer? So false negatives. All right. So the false negative rate then, we're gonna look at the total number who test negative, which is 100. And there are 15 of those who have a false negative. So I would say 15 out of the 100, which is 15%. So we have 15% false negative rate, which is high and bad, right? That's probably, the worst case scenario for this type of test, because if you get a negative, then you feel that you've been tested and you're not going to be treated. Uh, and if you don't treat a malignant tumor, that can spread. So 15% false negative rate is high and bad. All right, so here is kind of, and this is actually the way we're gonna do the math. I'm gonna show you this example, and then I'll show you the one that I was talking about for the COVID antibodies. So here, suppose a thousand people take a polygraph test, 10 of whom lie, and the polygraph is 90% accurate. How many of those applicants who are accused of lying were actually telling the truth? So if you have a thousand applicants and 10 lie, that means 990 are telling the truth, right? And the polygraph is 90% accurate. So it's going to correctly identify 90% in either case. Now these are the 10 that are lying. So if it was 100% accurate, it would tell us that all of them are lying, but it's only 90% accurate. So 90% of 10 is nine. So it's gonna catch those nine liars. And then the remaining 10% is one of them. So one person lies and doesn't get caught. But then the remaining 990 are telling the truth. But again, the polygraph is only 90% accurate. So it's only going to tell us that 90% of those, 90% of 990 or 891, it's going to tell us are telling the truth correctly. But it's going to falsely accuse 10% of those. So 10% of 990 is 99. All right. So there are gonna be these 99 plus these nine people that are accused of lying. 
but only nine out of that 108 are truly lying. So nine divided by 108 is about 8%. So in your polygraph test, if it tells you somebody is lying, there's still only about an 8% chance that they truly are lying, even if it's 90% accurate. Okay, let me give you my other example. Just with these kind of tree diagrams. So let's look at the situation. All athletes participating in a regional high school track and field championship must provide a urine sample for a drug test. Those who test positive are eliminated from the meet and suspended from competition for the following year. Studies show that at the laboratory selected, the drug tests are 95% accurate. And we'll go ahead and assume 4% of the athletes actually use drugs. What fraction of the athletes who fail the test are falsely accused and therefore suspended without cause? So this is a lot easier to do if we use concrete numbers. So let's say we're testing um, 1,000 athletes. All right, so we have 95% accuracy and we have 4% who actually are using drugs. I'm gonna give myself some space here. All right, let me redo this, sorry. So we're gonna test, we have 1,000 athletes. All right, off to the side, I'll make a note. So I have 95% Test accuracy, and I have 4% drug users. All right, so let's start with just the drugs, right? 4% of them are gonna use drugs. So 4% of 1,000 is 40 use drugs. And that means 960, we'll just say are clean, right? Oh shoot, am I not sharing anything? Sorry, Nam. <laughs> There's the work, sorry about that. So I just chose a thousand because it's a nice round number. You could do a hundred thousand, you could do a hundred or whatever. All right, so now I'm gonna apply my test, right? And my test is 95% accurate. So for those 40, it's gonna get 95% of them, it's gonna give me a true negative, or sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, a true positive rather, because they should be testing positive for drugs because they're using drugs. So 0.95 times 40 is 38. So it's gonna catch 38 athletes. And then it's gonna tell me, even though these other two were using drugs, it's gonna tell me that they weren't. So that's a false negative for two of them, right? All right. <clears throat> um, these 960 athletes are clean. But again, the test is only 95% accurate. So it will give me a true negative, which means it'll, it'll come back negative, which it should for these athletes for 0.95 times 960, 912 of them. But the remaining 48, it's going to give me a false positive. So it's going to accuse them of using drugs. All right. And so the question we wanted to answer was, what fraction of the athletes who fail the test are falsely accused and therefore suspended without cause?
So all I want to look at is the positive results. So I have these 48, those are false positive. I have these 38, those are true positive. I'll, to I'll total them up. And so 48 plus 38, that's going to be out of 86. And there are 48 of them who are falsely accused. So 48 out of 86. about 55.8 percent so over half of them over half of those that test positive are falsely accused all right any questions over that example um the last thing this isn't really an example that you have to write down but it's just an example of how statistics can be misleading um and it says, consider the two charts shown on the next slide, both purport to show the effects in 2011 of the tax cuts enacted under President Bush in 2001. The chart, the chart in figure 3.5a is created by supporters of the tax cuts, and it indicates that the rich ended up paying more under the tax cuts than they would have otherwise. And figure 3.5b, created by opponents of the tax cuts show that the rich receive far more benefits from the tax cuts than lower income tax players. And it's basically, they seem contradictory, but they're actually both accurate, okay? And so this really gets at, there's a famous Mark Twain quote, which is there are three types of lies. There are lies, damned lies, and statistics. And the idea behind that is you can cherry pick statistics to tell whatever story that you want, right? And, and this is something we talked about a lot, I think in unit two or in chapter two, where we said you, you always need to find the source of what the statistic being reported to you is, right? Because that can have a big impact on the way they are reporting it. Another good example that's relevant to today's life is schools going back and making these decisions on when to come back in person. Um, so when we left last year after third quarter, right, all indicators were much less severe of the COVID outbreak than they are currently. In fact, we're currently at the highest we've been by pretty much any metric that you want to discuss, be it deaths, be it daily infections, or percent positivity. I, the other day we were at like 23% positivity. It's like basically one in four people has it. Um, but now you'll see, especially politically, the, the, the people making the, these decisions, they basically want schools to go back, so they'll start cherry picking. <laughs> statistics they'll be like oh this one metric that's you know not we haven't been discussing at all we're in the green on this and it, it doesn't make a difference but we're going back um and i'm not necessarily saying that's going to be the case but if you pay close attention you'll start to see that rhetoric um of kind of three types of lies lies damned lies and statistics and it, and all i'm saying by that is that Yes, you can choose statistics to, to tell whatever story you would like. So it's really important that you, you are uh, familiar with the source of that statistic. Um, great. Okay, I think that's it for this section.